Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, how can schools build children's healthy coping skills and self-esteem? And I'm in conversation with Joe Morton-Brown. Hi there, my name is Jo and I work as an emotional health practitioner. So I'm quite lucky because it blends quite a few roles into one. So I'd say that my, my main bread and butter is delivering counselling and that's with four-year-olds all the way up to 19. Mm -hmm. So I'm based at a, a high school, a sixth form, delivering counselling. I'm a family support worker at a primary school and deliver clinical supervision and then a trainer of mental health, um, trying to educate adults about mental health that affecting children and young people. That's quite a lot of different jobs, Jo. <laughs> it is. It's great, though, because I never get bored. Never that's, get bored. That's a really nice way of looking at it. And do you find that working across quite a wide range of ages there, um, does that kind of impact on, on what you do? Do you have to do very different things with the different age groups or is it similar? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. So at the primary school, um, I deliver a kind of more as a family support worker. It's more kind time. So it's it's like mentoring. So it's 20 minute sessions because obviously children at school they're, they're they're so busy and, and you really can't provide that space for counselling at a primary school sometimes it's not as easy as that so I find that that's very much just playing and um, mm -hmm. stories going out on walks around the school playground and then as you kind of as they get older there's this more sense of, of counselling and certainly for the sixth formers for key stage five there's this real sense of appreciation of counselling and them having your time and then really trying to help themselves. And I think that's what's most rewarding is that as they're walking out, you might say to them, you know, just consider maybe the last time that you felt like this. And then when they return the next week, they'll sit down and they'll be like, oh, and I thought about that. And, and they'll have to really try and help themselves. So there's more of a sense of appreciation the older they get. That's really interesting. And do you think that that's partly because they have got really good at learning throughout their school career? Because I'm not sure you'd necessarily get that great of a response from an adult, would you? <laughs> not always, not always. I think because at, at secondary school, there's this sense of, of what's encouraged maybe by the parents. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's um, on, on the referral form, it's kind of got, is the student willing to attend counselling? And, and sometimes the box is ticked and, and they're sitting there and, and they don't necessarily want it, which makes it a lot harder in the first place. Yeah. But I just think that, yes, as they get older, they, there's more of a chance that they want to, to be there rather than having to be there. Because yeah. we both know that if a child's you know, encouraged and made to have counselling, it's not going to help. It's not going to really get to where you want to go to with them as a journey absolutely so the the kind of question for today's episode is around how um schools can build children's healthy coping skills and their self-esteem and i wondered if we could just start thinking about from your point of view why this matters and why it matters maybe like now more than it might have done in the past if you feel that's changed I think what's changed at the moment is this sense certainly for for students this sense of helplessness and I feel that with students that aren't coping, I think what makes it hard for them is just this sense of not knowing how to cope. And it's quite scary, isn't it, for, for adults? I know certainly for myself, when I'm, I'm delivering my counselling, mm -hmm. it's hard at the moment because there is such uncertainty. And we're asking these young people to cope whilst being at school, whilst maybe not seeing their friends as often as they'd like. Mm -hmm. um, within year bubbles and I think my biggest observation at the moment is that kids are getting bored with their year bubbles kids are getting bored with being in the same class with the same people and that's no disrespect to their peers but certainly I've got a little boy I think that he's just missing seeing the older ones or kind of just having that interaction and I can imagine that 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 must be something that must be hard for some of the kids as well so has your job changed in response to the current situation? Are you seeing different kids or doing different things with them? I think the hardest thing is it's a lot, it's, it's more restricted because normally in counselling, certainly at, at secondary school, yeah. normally there might be a game of chess or there might be some, some colouring or just some Play-Doh and, and just some kind of just gentle resources to use whilst interacting and, and, and delivering the counselling session. But obviously we can't use resources. Mm. And then the hardest thing, certainly with the younger ones, is that there is 
there is no resources there's 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 nothing like that and not being able to get close and have story time that's just because I've got one particular child that just loves story time and we'd n normally come in we'd grab the cushions on the floor side by side and read stories like literally 20 minutes worth of reading so mm -hmm. that's changed and that's made it harder and it's, it's when you find it hard as a professional it's really hard to try and contain that yes really that's hard that's been really hard to learn and then I just think that there's more about this and I'm not saying anxiety as in an anxiety disorder, mm. but for all our students, but certainly there's more students that are anxious, yeah. just in general, just leaving the house. It might be coming to school, certainly more attachment. I've seen a lot of, 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 of kind of that separation anxiety. Mm. Um, and that's not just your little ones. Um, and I, I almost kind of predicted this back in, in September. Mm. And I said to my boss that actually what we're going to see is all the primary school children it will be as if for some of them it's their first day at reception school yeah. certainly for the parents as well and then for secondary school it's for, for some of those students it's their first day at year seven first day again um, and that 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 was tough certainly at the beginning of the academic year seeing that just that separation between kids and has that settled over time or is that still an issue that you're you're observing now i think one thing that has i've i've witnessed is kids are far more resilient than we give them credit for. Um, they are so, so resilient and, 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 and we are too, um, but they really have surprised me. And, and I think that certainly during to lockdown um, or during that period of lockdown, I had a certain, I'd say there was a handful of students and there was three at primary school and there was two at secondary school. And I just was thinking to myself, having to park it thinking that we've just got them back into school you know this um emotional school-based avoidance you know gosh it's going to be so hard in september and do you know what pookie they have just nailed it they nailed the return so actually them having that time of school for some of them have really helped kids grow yeah. um and, or maybe given them a sense of appreciation that actually i'd much rather be at school than at home maybe yeah, so they begin to appreciate it in a slightly different way. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, they always I'd like say. I'd like to think so. <laughs> I'd like to think so. And how, as a, in your kind of family support um, worker role, how has that um, relationship between school and home um, kind of been important in, in this time? Has that changed? Yeah, that, that's changed. So I think communication is the biggest thing that I've seen between the school and the parents. Mm -hmm. And the way that the parents respond to the way that the school are dealing with with new restrictions and things like that. Mm -hmm. I'm really fortunate that the primary school I work at, they they are absolutely fantastic. And the head teacher's brilliant and, and she really gets well-being. The whole school has this real good focus about well-being. And actually, I remember back in September, it was the first they had the first three weeks was just that transition. Mm. and it was it was it was beautiful it was really beautiful um so i think that communication is the biggest thing between a school and the parents and then that obviously filters down because if you have calm parents then that will help just filter down to the children as well in in my opinion anyway no I, and and certainly that's something i've heard said a lot and you know a lot of my work focuses around creating that feeling of safety and that you know whether children are going to feel safe in school that begins before they ever leave home doesn't it so um yeah communicating home really matters and what do we need to be communicating with home it sounds like you've seen some really good communication happening there but what do we need to be telling uh, families and, and how can we do that that's a tough one i think <laughs> The biggest thing for for families is just to be reassured. Mm -hmm. um, I'm mum to a six year old, and I think that actually the hardest thing as parents is for me personally is I don't I've not met his teacher. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what his his classroom is like. I don't know where his tray is. I don't know where he puts his coat, and and it's so hard you know he's not allowed to take a bag in and things like that so as a parent it's really hard because there's this sense of you not being able to necessarily share the school day as much and communication between the teacher and the parent is so important um but obviously when you're on a school gate and you're all doing respected social distancing and you've got your mask you haven't got that you know did you have a good day or just that little bit of reassurance so i can imagine for parents it can be quite challenging too 
Um, but, but who would have predicted that we'd be where we are, you know? <laughs> yeah who we we're a really my family background is um we come from scotland so new year's day is really quite big for us and if somebody was just said to us on new year's day oh by the way this is how 2020 is going to be i'm pretty certain for me and maybe for you it's nothing like i'd imagined it to have been no absolutely and i think it's it's difficult as well i i'm personally finding this moment where we are right now sort of heading into winter very challenging because it feels like i think at the beginning there was this sense of we can get through this and now it feels like well maybe we're still quite near towards the beginning and we don't know what comes next and how do we plan for that and and how i mean in your work with children and with families and, and i guess you you work with stuff as well like what are you doing in terms of preparing for what comes next, given that we don't know how long this will go on for and what it looks like and whether there'll be further periods of lockdown or isolation or how do you prepare for that? I just kind of live in the here and now and we focus on, I really think it's important for children to tap into, no matter how young they are, to tap into like their why. And certainly for, for secondary school, I think it's really important that, um, we allow and we give a sense of hope. Um, I really believe that school is such a safe place for so many students, not just those students that are um, PP students or dis more, you know, more of a disadvantage, but just for everybody, for a majority of our students, school is that safe place. So I think that it's just making the most of the here and now. Yeah okay it's it's not great yes you're, you're best friends in the year above and yes you're not being able to see them but actually you know and i do think actually that there have been year groups that have become closer certainly year seven eight and nine so that's the ages of 11 to, to 13 14 that they've got closer um i had one student particularly back in in september that didn't know anybody in the class that she'd been put in she's in year eight mm -hmm. So second year at high school and she didn't know anybody in her class wow. and she would only see her friends at break and lunchtime because they're all part of the same year group. But actually what's really helped her is she's actually made new friends. Oh, that's good. New friends that actually we wouldn't necessarily sometimes do because we just stay with the ones we've got, don't we? Certainly when we're at school, you just stay with what you know sometimes. I think it goes way beyond school, doesn't it? Does, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> I think of that. It's one of the things I always find interesting is obviously I speak at a lot of conferences and things and people always hang out with the people that they know. And, you know, that idea that sometimes if you mix the groups up there, oh, that's a I love doing that, though. I love doing that when you're delivering the training and you get to mix people up when they've come in in twos and then you mix them up. I love it because it, it just brings a sense of togetherness with the group as well though doesn't it absolutely and I have to say for me it's been one of the um the really good outcomes from lockdown is how actually um when we bring people together we've all got this um kind of aim in mind of supporting our children and young people but it doesn't matter if we're a head teacher or a doctor or a parent or a social worker just everyone's in it together and we're all having to learn um and I feel that it's broken down a lot of those barriers and that yeah that that there's, there's a lot more sort of synergy really which has been really positive yeah, talk to me a bit more about helping children to find their why what do you mean by that and why does it matter and how do we do it so I think it's really important for those students that are maybe struggling emotionally and having far too many tough days yeah. for them to actually have this sense of hope and Obviously, working as a counsellor, I am working with students that are suicidal, that have lost a sense of hope, are feeling completely helpless. And I just think that it's really important that actually we can provide this sense of, of, of hope and, and providing them that actually the way that you're feeling in the here and now isn't going to, to last forever. It's just getting them to, to really keep going and working towards getting through this storm you know I read this quote that not always is a storm there to, to destruct things but actually sometimes it's to create a path oh. and, and that's actually I, I just want children and young people to realize that we go through these challenging times to help us become sometimes a better person from it and develop empathy and and know the power of, of or how important it is to to, to listen to somebody so I really think that if we can do anything for our, for our children and young people right now, it's just to, to get them 
that excitement of tapping into their why certainly those in years you know at secondary school you know if you, when you leave what do you want your legacy to be you know what do you want to accomplish in your life and just give them that sense of purpose so it's just a really good discussion a fun discussion to have like in small groups if not maybe in a class and what about those kids who are a little bit further on in their school career and perhaps they're uncertain about what's going to happen about their exams or, you know, there's so many students right now who've just gone off to uni and they're having a frankly horrible time. Um, and we know that our 16 to 25 year olds are this proportionately adversely affected by the situation right now and they're less likely to be in employment and just things look pretty bleak for them I mean how do we help them to connect with their why and to continue to be hopeful because just from where I'm standing it's a tricky moment for them mm -hmm. no like objectively hard <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the hardest thing certainly from our point of view is that we get to see how and that's not just as professionals for all of us but we genuinely as adults get to see how hard it is for them and and being certainly those that are at uni or gone into further education, you know, just that sense of loneliness mm. must be must be really big and, and, and really scary for some of them. But I just think that with regards to the, the kind of the, the here and now is that it's just having this sense of, of being in it together. Yeah. And that if they are feeling lonely and scared and not too sure if they've made the right choice or whatever it is, is it's just acceptance and just knowing that actually how you're feeling is completely natural, completely natural. And to, to just kind of acknowledge how they're feeling, just how they're feeling is I think sometimes it's, it's just the biggest thing and the most important thing. And, and really the only thing that we can do at the moment it's just listen be there with them and acknowledge that it's that i understand that it's it's tough right now and actually that you've not got it easy and i, I understand that and so it, it sounds like maybe you're you're tapping into their some of the sort of distress tolerance kind of skills yeah. and, and 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 that kind of thing and is that proving helpful and what does that look like in your sessions i think with with the sessions the hardest thing is no session at the moment is the same and talking about just going back to, to those that are in exams. So from the school that I'm at, we've got their GCSEs for those in year 11. And we've also got the sixth form that I'm at there. Um, they take three A levels. And the hardest thing for them is that I've, I've personally found that we've got two ways. We are either full throttle going for it absolutely every piece of work that they hand in is the most important piece knowing that if the exams don't go ahead then they're working each and every piece mm -hmm. is towards that central assess grade and then we've got other students out there that are just so deflated so demotiv um, demotivated in a sense that what's the point what's the point and, and it's so hard to, to try and lift them up because you can't reassure them that, you know, actually these mocks are really important because, you know, you are going to be sitting them shortly in a few weeks mm -hmm. because they'll come back with, oh, they might be cancelled, might not be in school. So it's really tough to, to try and get that, that middle. And, and certainly because I, I deliver an exam workshop to those in year 11. So it's small groups. And normally what I'm trying to tell them is, is, you know, when you drive a car, there's five gears. And actually what we need to do is, okay, we're going to need to go in a higher gear at our mocks, but then we're going to need to come back down because we don't want to burn out too soon. And, you know, we just want to sit sometimes around second, third gear and, and be ready to go for fifth gear when we sit our GCSEs. But at the moment, way too many students are in fifth gear, just like full, like fully going for it. And, and I'm just worried that they're the ones that are going to have burnout because if they do sit their GCSEs in the summer, you know, they're going to be exhausted from the work that they've been doing already. Absolutely. And that's something that we do tend to see in some of our students anyway. But you're saying you're, you're kind of seeing more of that. And, and it sounds like that it seems quite a reasonable response to the situation where they feel that every piece of work might matter but also I find myself wondering could this be a case of you know kids in a really chaotic moment in time taking control of something you know how well I do my work and how I focus on it is a thing I can control in the same way that sometimes we see that come around sort of food or exercise for example yeah and and there's that healthy and unhealthy ways of coping isn't it and I've seen an increase of an increase of self-harm um, certainly for students that 
so once I've seen a student, um, obviously working at the school twice a week at, at this particular school, it's quite nice because I might see them around the corridors or I have um, or I did have a, a drop in and that drop in was brilliant because they might not necessarily need me for, for weeks or months, but they knew that I was there. So that that was really lovely to have that reassurance. But the amount of students that I've, I've kind of have, have passed my door and they know that if my door's open, then I'm free to talk. And the amount of people that have been like, actually, Joe, can I can I see you? And then realizing actually that they've started to kind of go again with regards to, to, to that way of coping of self-harming. So where you've got children, young people who are coming to you now saying that they're returning to these unhealthier ways of coping like self-harm, um, are you finding that you're able to kind of rapidly help them course correct or is it more challenging than that? For some of them, <clears throat> it's a lot easier this time around because there's this certain sense of, of why they're doing it. And when you're able to say to them that actually, you know, for, for some of them, one one student in particular, bless her, um, during lock, sorry, before lockdown, she lived happily with mum and dad. Life was was kind of on a sense with regards to home life was was stable, mm -hmm. and now here in the after lockdown, parents are splitting up, but they're still living in the same house. And I have so many young people, so many young people who have that where they're living with both parents, but the parents have separated. Um, so it's just trying to get across to, to, to these young people that actually there is so much about, you know, that's out of our control. And I think sometimes it's, it, it can literally be, a, you know, a couple of sessions just identifying what stress they have going into their stress bucket okay and now let's circle what we can and we can't control and just giving that sense of of kind of understanding of actually you know this is why you're doing it and not to feel so you know the, the shame about it you know that actually this is what you did and, and it's okay it's okay there's there's so much around self-harm that's you know i really feel for kids because not a lot of adults get it um and obviously as parents, you know, there's so many parents promise me that you'll never do it again. And it's, it's hard for them. It's, it's really, really hard. So when they've coped in the past with that, it's natural for us to see them, them automatically feeling or, or going, being drawn back to that way of coping as well. And again, with eating as well, with eating, they're just the, the way of maybe binging um, or, or making themselves sick, just that control again. And I think it's it's quite natural, isn't it, that for any of us, whatever coping strategies we've developed, whether they're healthy or unhealthy, when we find ourselves in times of stress, that they are naturally the things that we'll return to, particularly if we found them to be effective. Um, so presumably a lot of your work then is about teaching children and young people healthier ways of, of managing rather than turning to those, those habits. So what kinds of things do you find yourself um, teaching young people? What do they find to be effective in place of things like self-harm or binging? I think sometimes it's about um, who we hang around with. So trying to get young people to realise that there's people out there that are like energy givers that make us feel good and lifted and, and, kind of aspiring and, and and feel good and then we've got what we call energy vampires that just suck the life out of us and leave us feeling tired so it's for children to become more mindful of, of who they're hanging around with social media is a big big one of just making sure that if they're online that they're watching the, the right things the right people that they're following the right people you know that compare and despair is horrible because now it's on their phone whenever they want it you know so it's it's just trying to get children and young people to to realize that they they do have this sense of responsibility online in particular and then trying to get children to realize the benefits of, of sometimes they're upstairs in their room too much all the time and it's just trying to get them to you know go downstairs Go downstairs and, and maybe when you make yourself a drink, maybe just stay down there for, for five minutes. You know, maybe instead of taking your dinner up to your room, maybe surprise your parents, your carers and, and sit and have dinner with them and, and just trying to get them to, to interact more. And then about kind of just staying active and, and that being well, physically well. Um, and I'm not asking them to go for runs. It's just to get outside with nature see fresh air, um, get fresh light and, and just enjoy those little things in life. 
Why does it make a difference um, spending less time in their room and being around the adults at home more? Why is that important? I think because sometimes what they're saying to me is that they feel lonely. And when you feel lonely, it's, I find that, and I've, I had friends and even my way of coping when we first went into lockdown for, for certainly some of my friends was just, they just went off radar, literally just closed down and went in. But with the students that I work with, sometimes they're the students that are saying that they're most lonely. So it's trying to get them this sense of appreciation. Okay, who is in your life? Yeah. Who do you feel that you can talk to? Okay, maybe how can we encourage you to talk to them? You know, or just to have that exchange of a, of a small conversation rather than how's your day? All right, see you later, bye. And the amount of parents and, and kids that, are, that text message one another when they're up in their room, like how's your day and things like that I'm like wow there's they're just they're in the same house <laughs> they're in the same house so um yeah that's uh, and, and and I think that's something to you know for, for parents and carers to, to think about as well isn't it about how can we um kind of encourage that sense of, of connection at home as well because we can sometimes be you know physically present but emotionally absent um and it's hard though and I get that because I'm a mum and and, and I know how hard and busy life is and I, and I get that. And I think that's the hardest thing is it's not easy. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just not easy to try and connect with them. It's certainly if they don't want to be connected, if they don't want to, to connect with you, I can imagine it's really hard, especially if you're a parent that's really trying as well. I was interested in um, when you were talking about social media and how, you know, we can end up in this sort of cycle of compare and despair. And I think we're all well uh, rehearsed in the arguments against some forms of social media. But I was wondering if you'd done any work with um, children and young people around how they can change how that makes them feel, you know, whether there are accounts, uh, for example, that they might proactively follow that made them feel good or they got something from. Yeah. I think, um, well, I started at the beginning of, of lockdown, I started a YouTube channel. Um, good segue I, there. <laughs> good segue there. <laughs> yeah, good segue, thank you. Um, so yes, I started this YouTube channel. I, I don't even know how to edit. I had a college last week get in touch saying, um, hi Joe, we really like your videos. We noticed that you, know, you don't know how to edit. Um, our sixth form students would love to take on a project and help you. Is that okay with you? And I'm like, yes. Like, <laughs> I have not got a clue what I am doing. Um, and it all started, I suppose. I went, I delivered a keynote speak, um, speech up in Leeds in February and had some feedback afterwards. You know, you should start a YouTube channel. Thought nothing of it. Mentioned it to my sister as I was driving home. And... I literally was just about to, to finish school and, and this sudden ending with the, the certainly the year um, 11s and year 13s or those that are at college, just mm. final. And it, I really felt it. And my sister rang me up and she was just like, Joe, if you're ever going to start it, do it now. And I started it and <laughs> I never thought it would take off as, as much as it has. But the reason I say about that is it's trying to, to get children and young people to because the internet and, and social media isn't going anywhere mm. it's not going anywhere and actually what we need to do as adults as parents professionals carers is we need to to, to educate them in in who they follow what kind of accounts they have and, and just monitor them to make sure that the people that they are or the videos that they are watching mm are, are of, of, of information or of, of, of kind of making them laugh yeah. rather than that kind of you know feeling I'm not good enough or I wish I looked like that um so it's just trying to monitor what they're on and, and obviously social media there is only so much as parents that you can do with monitoring um but it's you know but there are fantastic benefits of social media you know and and just the the power of the internet we can't underestimate that it, it doesn't have its benefits because for for one of my students that I see, she has got what she, she would consider her friends, her really, really good friends, as what you and I would call her online friends across the world. She's never met them, but she considers them as her, her true friends. Yeah. 
But actually, whilst that's not great, because I'd much rather her have friends in person, at the moment, due to the current situation, it's working for her. And actually, if that's bringing her comfort and a sense of purpose and, and having this, these relationships online, you know, with good people, doing great projects campaigns then then that's that's good and that's healthy and you know and that's the most important thing so and that's yeah. it. i mean i'm a bit biased here because a lot of my greatest friends are friends that i met first online um i really? find it easier to build relationships online than offline and i have now got some great friends in real life but many of them started online and i guess the difference is i'm an adult with means to to travel and um can then often turn these online friendships into offline ones and then they feel more real somehow but I could easily have have not done that and these would still be really important I don't know I, I think the online world has a lot to offer and particularly I think if you either if you find social interaction hard so I'm autistic and I do and online is easier um, or if you kind of find it hard to find your tribe and I think often um, so I work a lot down in Cornwall and if there are young people there who haven't necessarily been exposed to you know they don't meet lots and lots and lots of different people and they might not have the same opportunity to access things like their LGBT plus community. Um, but doing it online, suddenly they can be among people who are more like them and who they don't feel alienated. Do you know what I mean? I, I think get them, who get them and, and there's that sense of not feeling quite so alone, is there? Yeah, yeah. So I think it can be it can be really yeah, I don't know, I'm a b I'm a big fan, but then yeah, personally I found it to be a really helpful and useful place. That said, um I get completely the compare and despair thing. And again, it's something that, that personally as a fully grown adult I have to be really mindful of. Um I don't know if you find this as a parent and you know, you went into lockdown and you're trying frantically to to work and live and parent and everything all at once and everyone else seemed to be doing it better. <laughs> it was it was only when I went back to school which was after my half term, so June, that I actually realised how on earth, how on earth did I get through it? And mm. I don't know about you, because obviously you've got your two girls, but homeschool was an absolute nightmare, like an absolute nightmare. But then what we're asking from these children is to actually your safe place that you go home and you have fun or, you know, you go and you chill and you relax you know, we actually brought school into their home, into their safe mm. place. Um, and one of my private um, clients that I work with, she is um, at a college, she's studying three A-levels. The campus is so small, yet there's so many students that actually she's only going back two days a week out of five. Mm. You know, and it's trying to understand that that, you know, that her having to, to stay at home and, and motivate herself on those three days where she's at home yeah. with the same amount of work coming in is just so hard for some of our kids, yeah. so hard for some of them. Well, and likewise, we've then got kids who've gone off to university who've not yet met their course leaders or yes. their peers or, you know, and they've paid huge amounts of money as well. And I think that's not insignificant. You know, if you've paid a £9,000 bill and you're sitting in a room somewhere that's probably dingy and not as nice as at home even. Um, and uh, yeah, you're not accessing the things you'd hope to. I think it is a challenge, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So. I'm, I'm interested to learn a little bit more. Uh, I say this, I've watched quite a lot of your YouTube videos, but people listening might not have. So tell us a bit more about your YouTube channel and how you're trying to help with that and what has landed well and yeah, your kind of aims and aspirations for it. So I just found that on the internet that we had, certainly on YouTube, I know from Charlie, he just watched, you know, you can click on one thing to another and there's just so much to, like <laughs> absolute to. Um, and obviously with, with children and young people, there's, there's so many challenges that they face. And whenever I deliver my training, I always say, you know, that we've all been 16, but have you ever been 16 years old in 2020? No. So we don't know how important their phone is. Like, you know, you and I can maybe spend a day without it, but you know, for kids, it's their everything. So I just wanted to, to, to reach out to more kids, certainly during lockdown, because I knew that my kids that I was um, working with that had obviously then gone over the phone to on the phone counselling mm. was really struggling. So, and then it just got to a point where I now have teachers and um, parents that email me asking me to do kind of, could you consider doing a video on exam stress? 
So it's just trying to, to be the voice of trying to help kids become aware of actually, are you addicted to social media? Okay, if so, yes, let's do something about it. You know, there's, there's so many adults on the internet and on YouTube or, you know, TikTok. I'm not very great with social media other than LinkedIn and, and, and YouTube now. But literally, there's so many people out there to help others. But I just, and I, I've only found one lady, but even her videos, she's out in America, even her videos are for adults as well. I just wanted there to be this safe place for, for children and young people to go to that would be agreed by their teachers, agreed by senior leadership, agreed by their parents and carers and a safe channel that they could then, you know, have you lost somebody close to you, you know, how, uh, you know, how to be a good friend, you know, how to be a good listener, what to do if you're having a panic attack, exam stress, just all these, these different topics, but in a way that parents are, are kind of, knowing that there isn't going to be any swearing that it's that it's safe and that actually it's just somebody trying her hardest during this time of uncertainty because i'm not too sure where it's going and and it's since we went back to school it is hard to to try and do a weekly video but it's just for now whilst there's so much uncertainty just giving those kids what they need but i'm i can't believe like yeah, I'm just surprised because it's just me in front of a camera <laughs> talking. Um, yeah, but I love it. I love it. And have you have you found that the children that you work with face to face are also accessing those videos, or who's who's watching them? Yeah. yeah. So I think that's the most fun thing, um, and sometimes the most embarrassing, um, because when it's it's fine when it's strangers. Um, like I had a student from where was it? New Zealand a couple of weeks ago. Hi, just wanted to say I really love your videos. That's fine. Yeah, I can deal with that. But when it's people that know me, and certainly those those school kids that have had a session with me, yeah, you know, letting them listen to my telephone voice on a YouTube video just is is completely different, I imagine. But equally, they are, you know, Joe, I saw your latest video. You need to say like and subscribe within the first 10 seconds. <laughs> I'm not saying it. Oh, <laughs> so, um, but I don't like saying that bit. No, um, I never say that bit. I have to say I'm rubbish at that. No, and they always want to know how many subscribers I've got. You know, how many subscribers have you got? And I won't tell them because I don't even know how to to look at the analytics. If I'm honest with you, um, but yeah, it's just I enjoy it. And when you do get these these comments i remember when i first started getting an email from somebody out in america yeah. and, and this parent just saying you know thank you you know it's good to have a trusted reliable source i just remember reading it and crying and just like wow like wow really lovely and um, i think that that's one of the things about this kind of content so my kids are obsessed as well about like how many likes and subscribes and that sort of thing and how many views but actually for me it's about a lot more than that because it's about the impact of each of those views so that you know my kids will habitually watch youtube channels of people who've got literally millions of subscribers mm -hmm. but i've watched some of those videos with them and whilst they enjoy them i don't think they change how they feel whereas i think sometimes um you know you can make a video and it might only be watched by 50 people but if for one of them it meant that they felt differently that day or they did yeah. something differently as a result then that's really you know really high impact isn't it yeah and and I think I spoke to somebody the other day who was on YouTube that wants to do a collaboration that may, always makes me feel really good when they're like oh yeah I'd really like to collaborate with you I'm like really um <laughs> but I think that's the thing is that you know this this lad said to me you know, how long does it take for you to do your, your, your filming and your editing and, and everything? And I and I'd say to, I said to him, I was like, so we've got the smallest house and literally I only have in the mornings, like literally an hour on a Sunday to try and do three videos. That's wow. It. That's it. And then because I don't know how to edit, I just upload it. So that's why, just for your listeners, if they do watch it, my pronunciation isn't always the best. Um, we have a train that goes past, which is quite funny um, <laughs> because I haven't got time to press stop and to go again. And actually, this is this is how it is. Um, yes. Yeah, so but he spends seven hours recording, editing, uploading, doing the blurb. 
And I have not got that. I don't know about you, Pick. I'm pretty sure you haven't. Seven hours to do that. No, no. Mm. No, but then I guess also it's it's actually a thing that's being done in addition to everything else, whereas for many YouTubers, it's their source of income, yeah. their job, their life. Yeah. yeah. So it is a bit of a different. I, I have to say, though, one thing I have found is as I've learned more about it, how it, it's it's not a small job. So one of the things I took on over lockdown was working with our local church. So I sing in the choir and um, I worked with the priest to create the online services throughout lockdown. So we were doing prayers every day and then communion once a week. And I've continued to record communion live um, now that we're back at church and, and uh, kind of editing and uploading that and even though it's a very you know I, I do a very minor edit it's it's not I think people think that it's really really easy but it's actually quite hard isn't it yeah, I think that's why I don't want to start doing it mm. because obviously you can learn and I'm, I'm always up for learning mm. and there's these how-to videos and there's software that you can buy but I just I don't want to start and also for me I think that if I did start then it means it's actually something serious when at the moment I work full-time I run my own business, my little business flourish, and it's just a, a hobby. And it genuinely is a hobby that actually, if I was to buy the software or learn how to do editing, then for me, it's almost making it into something that I'm not quite ready for. Yeah, um, and I, I think there's also something about just being yourself and being kind of raw and real. And, and certainly it's something I checked in with myself on a few months ago when I made a video for my YouTube channel around perfectionism and good enough being good enough and how mm -hmm. actually I had gotten to a point where I would take multiple takes and I just thought, do you know what? Good enough is good enough. And, you know, if I were on a stage, which I often am, you don't get a second take then. Um, and you just do carry on. And I have moments, I don't know if you find this, but I have moments where I will be on stage and I, that's my happy place and my confident place. But still every now and then everything goes and I've got, it's just gone. <laughs> and you just, you know, you take a breath, don't you? And you start again. And yeah. I did um, a webinar yesterday um, to teachers. So um, it was with a company that have schools worldwide. So we had two webinars um, 600 so fully booked with 600 each and sometimes it is this you, you're prepared and you're organized and you get your room set up you get your photos taken down but actually there is just part of you that has to just live in the moment and just go with it and just enjoy it and I think and I know that you love your job as much as I love my job as well that actually I think that is what we have to do is embrace it knowing that actually whatever we do is good enough and that hopefully we are supporting those children and young people or supporting those teachers and pastoral staff social workers to help those those precious kids and young people that all need the support yeah. Even if they're the strongest of kids, they still need the support. They do. And I think that's the other thing is that when you keep it real and you help re people realise that you're sometimes muddling through because we all are, um, that it helps them to realise they can do this too. I think it can be quite empowering for people. Um, yeah, yeah, because I think we are all learning all the time. And this has been one of the most difficult things for me about this moment right now is that people look to me for answers and all I've really got is a bunch of questions um, because we don't know, do we? We don't know what's going to happen next. No, and I think that's the hardest thing is certainly for me as a counsellor, the hardest thing going back to school in September was as a professional trying to, we're quite good teachers, social workers, counsellors, we're very good at, you know, kind of almost compartmentalising whatever's going on in our life. So if we've gone through a bereavement, okay, let's just put this and I genuinely imagine a chest of drawers, just going to go in that drawer right now, yeah. not slamming it shut but I'm just going to push you click to and I'm just going to get on with my session and I'll deal with you after so we're very good at that as professionals but actually that what I found the hardest and, and even now it can still be a struggle is sitting with somebody that is worried about the coronavirus and is worried about this pandemic and for me I'm like that's in my drawer, <laughs> yeah. my drawer. <laughs> and then it's like oh gosh um and I think that's really hard um just trying to contain our own anxieties in a sense of whilst we're professionally working and it's tough i found it tough yeah I, I had an epic failure on that front earlier on in uh, lockdown where a parent asked a question at the end of a, a, a conference of me and she was saying that she had an, an an adolescent autistic son whose fear of uh, of the world and the virus had become such that he literally wouldn't leave the house and what would i recommend and my response was basically why would you leave the house it's so unsafe outside i don't know why 
yes. And I was in exactly the same boat. And, in, you know, I was able then to kind of pull it back and give some advice. But I was there with the sun. I would have just stayed home for a bit longer. <laughs> and I think in a way, that was what was so lovely about the first lockdown for me personally was I was safe. I was at home. The sun was shining, yeah. you know, and I do think that there was this sense of, you know, having an early summer. For me, my husband was furloughed, for, so for 20% less pay, we got 75 days together. Mm. And obviously, we'll never get that. 75 days where he's paid to, to be at home. Like, it was, just, it was just brilliant. But this time around, and I think like you said at the beginning, we just don't know how long it's going to last for. And, and I don't know when there's going to be the, the kind of this new normality but then I think about the kids uh, and I genuinely I'll never forget it was the 1st of May 2020 I had a crap day with my own mental health um, it was horrible I was crying I remember sobbing and Phil walked in and he was like what is the matter like what's the matter like who's died and <laughs> and I was just like oh my gosh like the kids out there you know this is going to have such a big effect and I was just really in a bad place for that day but it's just having to to allow yourself to have those days is the biggest thing and to know that we're not going to always have all of the answers and we can't always be strong we can try but it's not always going to be possible. And if it's not possible, then that's okay, um, is the hardest thing. But it is just taking it day at a time. Um, I think the weather, just being in the, the winter now, I think that's having a, a big difference. And also there's so much, and I'm not getting into the politics, but there's so much um, disagreements, um, protests about, you know, the whole pandemic and how it should be dealt with, with adults. I kind of think to myself, the poor kids that are, that are picking up on this, certainly secondary school, you know, that's not fair. And we're asking them to wear face coverings. And there's people protesting saying that they're not going to be wearing face coverings and made to do what they need to do. And it's like, we're not exactly all setting a best situation no. for our kids to be growing up in calm. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to stop on that bit because <laughs> it's just hard because I just wish that we could the kids could just see us, I don't know, it's just hard for us adults. So it's even harder for them because obviously we know that what we project is what they pick up and, and that must be hard for them. I think, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it is difficult because we look around us and it doesn't feel necessarily like we're, yeah, as, as a adult society role modeling what we would hope to perhaps, but you know, things will change. It is what it is, is what I say, and it's not going to last forever. And we got through the First World War, the Second World War, the, you know, the Spanish flu, you know, we'll get through this. And just trying to tell the kids and when I deliver the clinical supervision that the sky hasn't fallen, the mm. world hasn't ended. And, and we're in this together. You're not on your own. We are in this together. Mm. Um, when I went traveling, there was in Thailand, they have this saying, or they did like, oh God, 15 years ago, um, same, same, but different. And this experience of, of, of lockdown, of the pandemic, it's, it's same, same for everybody, but it's very, very different for each and every one of us. So, but that same, same of, of being in this situation is, is something that we can, can unite us and Absolutely. unite children and young people as well. And what, what thought would you like to leave people with? How would you like to end today? So I believe that as adults, parents, carers, but more so professionals, that sometimes we underestimate the power that we have and how we can influence children and young people. And I get a lot of people say to me, you know, that need, feel as if they need training to, to become an expert on mental health teachers that don't feel as if they're qualified enough and, and I get that but actually you are you are all you need to do is just offer this sense of professional love just be there for, for your your school kids or for those children and young people that you work with just be there just provide that safe safe space safe place let them be heard show them that you're listening show them that they matter enjoy their excitement with their future 
and just realize that every there's this um quote every um interactions and intervention and just never underestimate the power of what you your work is and what you can do as a professional because you're fantastic doing what you're doing mm -hmm.